six o'clock on November 6th. Keep track of the months here. Yes, November 6th. Uh, so we'll call the uh, Community Development Committee uh, meeting to order. And uh, we'll note the attendance of uh, myself, Councilmember Johnson, uh, Councilmember Christensen, uh, Mayor Ross, uh, and um, no longer interim, uh, but uh, City Administrator Chambliss, uh, as well as Councilmember Watton. Um, I believe that Councilmember Mayhew will be here shortly, but just to make sure, uh, are we okay to excuse him in case something happens on the way? Okay, then he'll be excused um, if he doesn't come. Uh, okay, so that takes us to the agenda. Uh, anything do you want to change about the agenda? No. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if we, um, uh, yeah, if we get to um, talk about some of these other things before uh, Councilmember Mayhew gets here, then um, I think that we should move the council priority tracker down to after the affordable housing because I think he had the most things to add there. Um, so I want to make sure that we um, that we got that covered. Okay, so then uh, with that, uh, we'll go to public comments. I do not see any uh, members of the public joining us remotely or um, here in the council chambers. So uh, we will move to the next thing, which is the minutes. And <clears throat> for the minutes, uh, I did not have anything in particular to point out or change? Uh, did you have anything? I did change. Okay, then uh, we'll go ahead and consider the uh, minutes approved. Uh, here it comes. We'll wait just a moment. Welcome. We'll note uh, Council Member Mayhew joining us at six o two. And uh, we just uh, were about to uh, officially say that we were adopting the minutes. So did you have anything you wanted to add real quick? Nothing to add. Okay, great. Then we'll uh, consider the minutes adopted. Not like last time. Hold on, 15 <laughs> minutes. Okay, uh, there are no agenda bills. So uh, then since Councilmember Mayhew is here, we'll go ahead and move straight into the council priority tracker then. Um, <clears throat> I'll let you get settled, but just to cue uh, this up, um, uh, what we wanted to talk about was uh, how we had the council priority tracker. Uh, I forgot to bring my copy right in front of me here, but um, there were a number of items that uh, we wanted to add, and we just wanted to see uh, if there were any uh, clarifications we want to make on what those additions were, but then the other additions. Um, so just uh, running through these, uh, one of the big things was affordable housing, mm -hmm. uh, that we wanted to add that, and um, that there were three elements to that that there's the use of city land, there's the use of city funds, and there is the use of policies. Um, for example, the multifamily tax exemption, uh, which is um, which we have done some work on already. Uh, another item was tourism. A number of years ago, I remember this committee was actually working on a tourism plan and that that shifted away uh, from, from that um, particular uh, procedure, but uh, the tourism is still certainly a focus for the city uh, and for this committee. That there was uh, prioritizing the desired features for the UGA, which I do think is complicated to some degree because of um, the uh, requirements for some of the housing elements. If we can't get certain waivers and stuff, there might be things that we need to do in order to meet those obligations. Um, I'm just running through what we had so far, and then, then we'll circle back to um, anything in particular we want to talk about. Uh, there was the impact of uh, fee to trust development. Uh, the various elements of the comp plan uh, were not uh, listed. And I think that that's a good point that uh, those would be coming through us and they've already reached us to some degree. Uh, human services, uh, what gaps do we still have to fill? Um, update on items in the future to help guide priorities. Uh, and then there was uh, some discussion of um, perhaps some other columns that might be useful. Uh, in particular, what's the purpose? Why, why are we doing it? And then finally, what's the end goal, which I interpreted as meaning like, how would we know that we had succeeded? We haven't done this thing. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, was there any further discussion of other items or was there any clarification that either staff or, or we as committee members uh, needed on those items? Councilman Mayhew. Yeah, just two quick things. Um, that's 
virtually everything that I had on my list. That's fantastic. Um, in terms of that last item you mentioned, which is the goal or mm -hmm. how we know that I use the word outcome, you know, yeah. so I don't, I don't know if that's helpful, but you know, um, perhaps, but uh, the only thing I wanted to say a little bit more on is the tourism. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that that's, that what I'm thinking is getting captured by that. So in the last 10 years, the city has done, has spent millions of dollars trying to revitalize downtown, um, looking ahead to what is the future. We do have, we've over the last 20 years adopted three different iterations of downtown plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, let me back up. We've not adopted any of those iterations. We've had three plans done, which to my knowledge were not per se adopted, but elements of them have been being worked on. But we spent millions, but there is a lot more that needs to be done, even in the vision of those plans. And I'm still extremely concerned about where we're at because despite all that we've done, each year we have less retail downtown. Just in the last year, we've lost another restaurant. Now, granted, COVID was kind of a hard hit, but we haven't, those restaurants haven't come back. So just the list of restaurants that we've lost in Snoqualmie in the last four years seems a significant number of them are gone and we're not finding ways to attract them back. Now there's different kinds of retail restaurants, not the only kind of retail. Um, but I know the um, downtown merchants association is very worried about this trend and how do we get more retail? They're worried that we seem to be shifting that, that these properties seem to be filling up with services, not retail, which depending on the service can generate traffic that can help retail, but it depends what service it is. Many of them don't, but um, more importantly, sort of there's this, um, this sense of, uh, of, of a critical mass. Are there enough retail that we can attract people into downtown and have them spend time there such that um, they, they come for one reason and then stay spend money on multiple reasons so I'll, I'll admit and you guys may not you may find this hard to believe but it turns out i do have to have my hair cut periodically and i have shame on me not been getting that done in me. i now do and what i found was isn't it interesting i went down to have my hair cut and then i went next door and had a cup of coffee so this is the kind of thing we want this so that was an example of a service but um, I will say um, we used to think, let's go downtown and we'll pick one of the restaurants when we get there. My family doesn't do that anymore. We don't go downtown for a restaurant unless we picked it already, just because there's only a couple there. There's more than a couple, but there's not many, depending on where you go, that are open. So I think there's this whole idea of the river walk. This was a big vision of how we might bring people into Snoqualmie. Um, we spent a lot of money, got some state grants um, to support that. So we were heavily moving that direction. It's a whole issue. The tribe has a lot of concerns about how that would get executed, but fine. We've talked with them. We've done, you know, agreed on some things that, that make sense to them. But if that's not the answer, then which everything I've seen says it is, we haven't really been pushing that. Let's get pushing that again. And if if that's not the answer, then what is? But I'm really worried that we are not expanding our retail core. And unless we do that, I'm very worried about the future of our downtown retail. So when I say tourism, I wrote it as um, increased to tourism to support Snoqualmie businesses. Because why tourism to support the businesses? So really... In a way, tourism is not my main point. It's supporting downtown businesses, more of them, critical mass, more foot traffic, uh, that sort of thing. Now, 
yeah, if we could attract more people from the falls, we've never figured out how to do that. But if we could, great. Whatever we could figure out, uh, maybe people coming to a model train museum. I don't know. But let's let's get we've I think if we as a city are not focused on this and helping, I don't think that downtown retail group is it it doesn't seem to be on its own expanding. It seems to be going the other direction. So we've got to find more ways to help, I think. So that's I just want to say a bit more about that. When I say tourism, it's not tourism per se. And it's the amount of sales tax we're talking about. It's tourism to support our businesses. We've got to find ways to support our businesses. And I think we maybe ought to be looking at a lot more than just tourism, maybe spending the kinds of money that we've been spending in the millions to build to attract more people into our retail core and, and especially in the shoulder seasons, keep those guys going. So that's everything else I think was covered great, what really well, but I really think having downtown Snoqualmie business in particular, but Snoqualmie business broadly supported, I think we've got to find ways to do more than we're currently doing. So that's what I'm thinking of when I see this tourism item. Uh, one of the things that I'm hopeful that we could get going at some point is a uh, trolley car mm -hmm. in the falls. Uh, and then if they park there, then they take the trolley into downtown and then they're stuck until the trolley <laughs> goes back. So might as well get an ice cream or a cup of coffee or something. Yeah, but what a great outing that becomes, right? So we go, we park, then we go to the falls, and then we go down. Right? Like that just becomes a wonderful experience for a family. So that's exactly the kind of thing I'm thinking. But I, I think... It's not happening on its own. I think the city has to find ways to, and, and it's not a little thing. It's lots, lots of different things. Right. Okay. Uh, yes, Mayor, Mayor Ross. I know of a trolley car that's on wheels. So it could go to the mill site, to Salish, to downtown, to <clears throat> casino and back around. So, so there's less options there. Yeah, and I know that there are some issues with uh, using the rails with PSD. I don't know what all the details are, but there's some issue going on with that uh, that would have to be overcome. Um, my hometown of San Luis Obispo has a historic trolley car that's on tires. <laughs> Trains are on wheels, too. <laughs> I know what you meant, <laughs> tires. Um, yeah, uh, that would go all over downtown. It only cost a quarter. In fact, uh, all growing up, it was free. And then they were like, well, we need a little bit more revenue. And just a quarter was enough to keep the program going. And uh, to my knowledge, it's still going to this day. Um, yeah, so something along those lines could potentially be something that would be easier to get to and uh, more sustainable. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but it could be. <laughs> when you were a young man, a quarter went a lot farther than it does now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still a quarter, though. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Uh, anything else on that? Okay, then uh, does staff have what they need to update our uh, priorities for the committee? Any, any other information on that? Okay, so just add a few more lines and then kind of reissue it to the council. Okay, excellent. Then uh, that takes us to the next item, which is affordable housing. And I believe that uh, Council Member Watton is here to give us an update on uh, what the regional task force has been working on, which we asked them to work on. Thank you. I just lost my, my screen. There we go. And then, um, perfect. <clears throat> Good evening, Chair Johnson. Council Member Christensen, Council Member Mayhew. So this is an update on what the Snoqualmie Valley Housing Task Force has been working on. And really it's a compendium of, of projects that are ideas. And I'm just the note taker. <laughs> so I wish I could take credit for this, but really um, this helps to flesh out some of the, the questions that you have, I hope, and, and it just gives you a kind of a robust roadmap forward. So first of all, I wanted to start with just the um, housing objectives that we've kind of discerned and, and Council Member Washington's been a huge part of this as has uh, Council Member Christensen in our discussions. We've had a lot of uh, people across the Valley help out in other cities. Um, we've had housing experts that make this their profession every day. 
um, lending their expertise and and uh, as well as funders uh, from from two banks that do this on a daily basis. So we have had a, a number of people um, help with this idea. So the desired outcome is is focusing on something that looks like fifty to eighty percent median income. Um, a lot of that we have to keep in mind that the low cost of um, funding comes at that 50 and 60 percent AMI. However, that does not exclude mixed developments where um, you find market rate um, integrated, which this council adopted in part through the mill site development agreement, which uh, is um, <clears throat> an awesome project i think the other thing that's holding us back right now are capital markets that uh, now's just not a good time to be borrowing money when it typically typically has been in the fives and now we're at eight and a half um on borrowing so the other thing is that we need to talk about potential builders and investors and uh, director arteche has wonderful list of of potential partners and uh, that becomes kind of our target the other thing that we have to keep in mind and that's access to essential services like transportation supportive services and council member johnson's walkability thing that <laughs> is always in the back of my mind is we need to make sure that um we integrate it into the city so that um, you can either go to the Ridge Merchants or downtown so that it's easily walkable. Acceptable scale is the other thing that we often talk about. You know, it is always is that when you build larger, you get scale and you get scale, you know, the, the, the efficiencies of scale. It's just how far do we push those limits? So that's always going to be, um, something that is we need to be mindful of and then the other one is housing mix and i think that if you look at our mix right now we're heavily loaded on home ownership well that is you know one pathway that we want to take in consideration we have a huge need in rental type um housing and then the other one that i didn't add on here and that's um permanent affordability mm -hmm. and that that was a piece that um, uh, in the early years of Snoqualmie Ridge that that was kind of not baked into affordable housing it was met but it wasn't something that could be sustainable so if we move to the next slide here I'm putting together a menu of housing strategies ways to accomplish this and there are things to think about. So first of all, we talked about different types of houses, tiny homes, micro apartments. Here's one, co-op apartments, where maybe you have a room, but four or five share a kitchen. And that's an idea that doesn't always work well with lenders. Um, it's, it's kind of a one of those things that is on the perimeter, but we need to keep it kind of in the wheelhouse because that's another way to help lower the cost. Um, land trust arrangement, you know that from Habitat for Humanity, where it's owned by the nonprofit. Another one is Homestead Community Trust, um, land trust. They That's another option. It could be something that's owned by the city. There's liability that goes with it. So oftentimes you're better off having a 50-year or 75-year agreement with a um with a nonprofit that can handle that. Here's an interesting idea. And we have the affordable housing reserve funds, the tax, the sales tax at 0.1% sales tax that we're setting aside at a clip of about 370,000 roughly a year. And we now have a fund of about 1.2 million. What if we incentivize the builder? And this is a more recent idea say that it's $50,000 per unit at 50%, 30,000 at 60% or 15,000 at 80% to help buy down the cost of those construction fees. Um, 
The other one is um, allowing a, or offer an allowance for utility street development um, from those same affordable housing reserve funds. I may be using the wrong terminology, but um, anyway, I think you kind of get the gist of, of those funds that we've set aside. We've already used the um, multifamily tax exemption. Uh, so we could use that on, on future developments. Um, blended development allow up to 50% of the units at market rate might be another concept that you want to consider. And finally, um, housing that meets the needs for single family and seniors are all part of the consideration. Um, so that brings us to, we've looked at basically three properties, four properties. One is, is privately owned, um, three are city owned properties. The one that's, that is in the forefront is 9030, we, we call it 9030. It's the property that's on the parkway below Habitat for Humanity. It is the extension of the Gravenstein and there's a little over an acre, maybe somewhere around an acre, acre and a quarter there. And that seems to be the most viable. <clears throat> so the question is, do we move forward with that as an RFP, RFQ? That's up to this committee to decide how to move forward on. Um, so I, I think the, the one thing that we want to do is optimize the use of it. So rather than using it for half a dozen homes, that if we could put more homes on it and more homes at the lower AMI, that makes it feasible for a builder to come in. So I, what I want to do is give you an idea of, you know, things that you could bake into an RFP that would make it enticing for the nonprofit or for-profit builder to come along and say, hey, we'll do that. So as we, you know, talked about, give them incentives either for utilities, for, um, you know, the, the pre-construction costs for um, units that meet that AMI level that we're trying to achieve um, as an incentive. We could potentially bond against what we have in our, um, in our taxes for affordable housing. I'm not an expert in that. I just said back of the envelope, you know, we could turn that $1 million into maybe $7 million. But do we use it on one project or we do it on a number of projects and where we only pull um, part of the money from, from that fund for that purpose? So you have a lot to decide. And this is the fun part. I get to tell you all the good things that you can do and somebody else gets to figure it out. So where we're at. There were three parcels I mentioned. The one was Habitat for Humanity. Parcel two is across the parkway. And I have talked with a couple of the folks from the tribe and said, okay, out of the municipal campus of six acres, we've developed maybe an acre and a half for the fire department. Would the tribe be interested in helping us do affordable housing on the balance that they agreed for the municipal campus. We will not move that idea forward unless we have their blessing. The third one is more, uh, more controversial and we have this wonderful intersection at Fisher and it would require us to find an even more awesome park and use the space that's on the parkway. That has resulted in a lot of, I don't think so, remarks. So it is an option. So with those three, it comes back to the one. What is most doable today? And the most doable is the one that is 90-30. And so that's kind of our recommendation, if you will, without having any process of um choosing a project all we're doing is vetting things for you so where are we at today we're at determined potential city-owned parcels that's where we're at 
I think for the council, it would be really good to go back and discuss those housing objectives. What do we want to achieve? And then how do we use the tax funds that we have as an incentive in the RFP, RFQ? And from that, our next step would be to develop the RFP, RFQ, and then take council action, issue that to the potential developers and staff would be handling that. At that point, we'd invite in uh, potential builders. Um, we already have an architect and two engineers that are ready to be on site on those visitations at no cost to the city as part of the task force. Um, and then finally is the determination by the council along with the mayor as to how do you evaluate those RFPs, RFQs. And then we um, award the development rights and the staff monitors and reports on the progress. Questions, dots, concerns? Thank you very much, uh, Councilman Browatton. <clears throat> uh, one question that I have uh, is, uh, how long have we been uh, collecting uh, the, I believe it's a sales tax that's in the 1.2 million that we have. Remember? Also, member Mayhew, do you remember? Oh, three years. Three. So, yeah. Okay. So if we waited another three years, could we expect we would have, um, yeah, 2.4 million? Uh, Councilor Mayhew. Yeah, so it's, as Councilor Watton uh, pointed out, it's it's sort of collecting at a clip of about, I think he, he had the most updated number. Uh, somewhere. It's north oh. of 350 a year. Yeah. You know, um, it's got a 20 year horizon on it. That's that um, enabling legislation from the state limited us to that time period, but that's what we passed. Those aren't the only funds that the city has, by the way, that could be, that that have been restricted for um, this there is some other money kicking around it's not many millions but there it's hundreds of thousands at least other so but that's sort of accumulated over time so there's sort of a nest egg if you will if you if you want to think about it that way if you want to think about it as an ongoing stream it's the number that councilmember Watton was uh talking about so um that yeah I that's my understanding of the answer to your question so I guess my uh, the reason I bring it up is that it sounds like we have one lot that uh, is about an acre. Uh, you can't build something too giant on that. So I can't imagine that we're talking about, you know, a 15, 20 million dollar project um, to build on one acre. Uh, so 1.2 goes a long way. Um, 2.4 million will go even farther. If we waited a little bit and it sounds like we've got 20 years so you know yeah we got to move on something but also if we move too fast then do we just end up having a pile of money with nothing to spend it on since there aren't too many other developments that are going to have significant affordable housing um, just the thought councilor Mayhew. yeah so i i think that's certainly valid in my opinion thinking and reasonable thinking um i think one other thing to think about is there are many other ways that we can try to address housing needs um temporary housing uh everything from the sort of very apparent um issue of when you've got homeless folks and you're trying to get them in shelters you know do we want to help and by the way the city does help currently not out of those dedicated funds but out of general fund amounts we do help in that regard um you we could do more but i think as you talk to folks um who who are kind of working in that area the the bigger no i won't say it that way another win that we can have is how do we keep folks in housing okay once someone's lost their housing getting them back into housing is a much bigger challenge as it turns out and a much bigger financial commitment than finding ways to keep them in housing where they're struggling. But if we can keep them in their housing, um, plus obviously if, if you're talking about a family with kids, the disruption, there's just a lot of other things to think about when you think about keeping folks in housing. 
Uh, you can also think about the kind of housing where someone has a temporary need that they can then, you know, transition to something else. Um, you know, so um, what's the the kind of wording I'm talking about? Um, folks that are in crisis, shall I say, and under threat, and you want to move them from that environment to a safer environment, temporary housing, while you can move them on to something else. So that turns out these needs are, you know, there's a lot of needs there. And we got one source of money and one sort of, what did I refer to it earlier as a, a pot pot or, or nest, you egg. Know, nest, nest egg. egg? Yeah. So there's a lot of ways you can spend that money. Um, the amount that you commit to something like getting more permanent housing built um, is, you know, what Councilmember Watton's talking about. By the way, another angle on that is, do you want to use that money to take housing that already exists that isn't low-income housing and try and cause it to become low-income housing? So find someone who would buy that housing, but then commit some or all of it to low-income if we put in some of these incentives that Councilmember Watton's talking about. So there's a number of different things the one thing I'll say is in my six years on the council, um, we have looked at this lot as just uh, and come to the same conclusion. Um, we've been various council members, administration staff, and pretty consistently come to the idea that that sort of looks like the most promising lot. To be clear, it's not a great lot. Mm -hmm. It's got issues with um, the hill that it's on. It's got issues with uh, surrounding wetlands it's you know it's it's um it's got a lot of issues with it that's it's not a you know real easy cheap lot if you will or inexpensive lot to build on so the issue has always been how do we attract any developer to try and build something and it's all the kinds of things that council mayor watton was talking about but the sense has been we've never got a single bite and so my worry is that right now where we're at, we're really, we haven't yet moved the ball enough that we'll get any bites. So we can issue an RFP. I don't think we'll get any proposals. Or let me say it differently. I worry whether we would get any proposals based on, and by the way, as Councilmember Watton talked about, right, right this minute is a horrible time. Yeah. Because by the way, if you bond something, the amount you get out of that is way less than it would have been two years ago because the interest rate you pay over the time period is much higher. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but similarly, a developer who has to borrow is, you know, it just changes the equation on what makes things pencil out for them. So it's a tough time. So my comment with all of that is, I think if we're going to get a bite, let me say it differently. If we're going to get interest in that lot, I think maybe we need to take those ideas that Councilmember Watton has just outlined. And I think we actually have to put it into a proposal saying we're willing to do this we're willing to do this. We have to say the things we're willing to do. If we don't, if we leave it vague, I think a developer thinks to themselves, okay, well, they seem to be willing, but they haven't really thought it through. How much work is this going to be? You know, I, I just think um, we're going to face the same challenge we've faced for the six years I've been involved. So I think we're close. I think we would need to leverage this work into a... Um, a proposal with a lot of items in it if we are going to have any success yes um community, community development director Arteche. yeah i just wanted to clarify that um i believe uh council member wanton meant another tax parcel uh, he was using another four digits and and i just highlighted the one on screen it's 9033 um so okay you, thank you yeah for that clarification. you, you might have been referring to this little guy right here which right, is that's um, one. yeah 90902 but we're not we're not talking about that one so, so how big is the 9033 um it's it's got about an acre clear out of uh critical areas and other um you know encumbrances so density wise we can as we learn from the mill site we can use 14 acres in the formula and 12 units per acre. I mean, we've got more than enough to go as big as we as we want to go on an acre. 
we kind of penciled out it could be up to a hundred units. However, parking is a is Definitely going small. to be a challenge. We did talk with the engineer, the two engineers, and the architect. And first of all, they said the drainage is the correct direction, which is a plus. And secondly, is we do this all the time for affordable housing. So it's not out of the realm of, of something that's conceivable. And then the other one is a slope. The slope is about 35 feet from the top to the bottom or maybe 40 feet. So you could put a four story building there and you wouldn't even necessarily know that there's a four story building. It's not out of scale from that standpoint. It would look like it's two stories or something. Right. Yeah, Councilor Romeo. Yeah. Just um, in that regard, one thing that I didn't see on your list, but I might have missed it, but I thought had been mentioned in the past was the idea that for exactly the reasons you were just talking about, that perhaps the council might want to consider some zoning change for that lot that, that would enable the height um, to go perhaps a little bit higher, but because of the slope and the things you were talking about where it's located and so forth, that that might be compatible with really the objectives behind that zoning. So is that something, I don't know if you have a, uh, Councilmember Watton, if you have a view on this or not, but is this something where you think we ought to also be looking at the zoning restriction there to help make that more attractive to a developer, or do you not have a view on that? I My view is Director Arteche. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're talking about the mixed-use zone, so um, uh, lots of flexibility in there, including you know provisions that would go to council to um, create exceptions you know from from the rules so there, there's lots of opportunities I wouldn't um, I would not go um, to um, another zone or something like that when this zone allows you so much creativity so just part of the big blob I think so just to be clear with the zoning that exists the council could grant some height uh, additional height that's sort of within how that zoning yeah, works yes exactly yeah so that so that's just my point is it seems like maybe that ought to be on the list if that helps is going to help a developer pencil this thing out but it, it seems just I guess my main point is if we don't take that list of possible things I mean there's it, <clears> a lot of work here but we have sort of known all of those possibilities for the whole six years that these aren't new possibilities they're just people are spending time really developing their thinking around it but i think the experience that i've had is unless we put that into some package that specifically names things we're willing to do we're just not getting interest from a developer um because it'll look like too far to go from here to actually getting something done we're gonna have to move it far enough along that they see you know something interesting with a path on it so i i just think I do worry about how we get to this. I'm kind of, I'm not sure if RFP is the way to go, but whatever it is, it's something like get interest, put something in front of somebody and get interest, call it whatever, you know, whatever that ends up being. But I'm just worried about how do we get from here, which is perhaps close, but in my experience, not close enough. How do we get to something that is something we can, that has what's necessary in there? And I know we're so staff challenged right now. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, how do we, get that done because it's it's so exciting to try and do it well one thing is perhaps we need to make the commitment as a council that we're willing to do x y and z one thing i was just thinking about is <clears throat> that uh if over the last three years we have i'm just going to call it the 1.2 million maybe there's other stuff as well but let's just go with that let's say every three years that's about what we get then uh, rather than thinking of it as well that's all that we can spend right now then can we think that over the next 20 years, we have many millions that we could put toward this and we could commit over, you know, the course of the next 20 years, you know, we'll give you a bazillion dollars, <laughs> you know, to do this development um, that, uh, yeah, there's actually quite a significant amount that we could put toward the one development. I realize it's a lot of money to commit, but um, these funds are specifically only able to be spent on this one thing it's not something that we could say hey let's put this toward the parkway or whatever else so why not uh 
now, Councilman Mayhew also brought up the idea that there are other things we could spend on, and I completely agree. We do have the issue of the pie is only so big, and eventually you start yeah. getting tiny slices of pie um, that uh, that no one uh, would find attractive. So I wish I could put this trap. I feel so tiny right here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm way down. Um, but uh, anyway, just uh, just sort of a thought there is maybe we could actually make a fairly sizable commitment to a developer uh, if we've got 20 years to collect all this money. Uh, Council Member Christensen. Um, so I I agree that that's an option to go forward. I would have a little bit more anxiety about promising money that we don't have on an ongoing basis because that would obligate future councils to go down the same path that we have without getting any flexibility there. Um, I, I'm certainly happy to to look at it more and get more information about how what our revenue stream would be if this is sales tax and we're concerned about our our downtown businesses, things like that. I just, I wouldn't want to count my chickens before they've hatched there. Um, I just shooting from the hip, I'd be more interested in, in committing to a, a pool that we have now, or would have like in the very near future and saving the future portions to be put towards needs as they continue to develop. Um, but I'm, I would be happy to look into to all of that as well. It's just that that's where my concern would be about obligating that much that far down the road oh absolutely sense. and uh another thing on that is that uh if uh you know interest rates are terrible right now for developers then you know it doesn't sound like this might be something that's happening tomorrow anyway yeah. uh so we could be looking at um uh, you know a little bit larger pool by the time that this um uh this could actually occur mm -hmm. and at that point sure that money would be something we would have in hand that we could uh, provide. And then um, in terms of slicing up the pie, then maybe those later uh, funds we could collect, those could go to those other things, but we aren't committing them to anyone right now. Uh, I don't know if that math made any sense. <laughs> it did in my head. Um, but basically, the there could be in the somewhat short term next couple of years, a significantly large amount that could put toward this project. And then there are other concerns that um, we could put the rest of the funds toward. Um, as as we go, Councilman Mayhew. Yeah, I, th I think your comments and your math thinking are make sense to me. I, I think the key thing that was said is our pie is very small. As much money as that sounds like, it's just not very much money. Um, that amount of sales tax at a place like Bellevue generates a huge amount of dollars. We're just a small town. It just, it's not nothing, but it's not a lot. So the trick is, I think the kinds of things that council member Watton was saying, which is how do we, it's all about leverage. How do we make the difference so that private money will do something that they might otherwise not have done? The thing's going to have to be pretty close to workable or it's just never going to happen. We don't have enough money to turn an unworkable thing workable. But we do have enough money to take a thing or, and when I say money, enough tools, mm -hmm. some of which is money, some of which is, and you know, tax credits, some of which is property. It, there's a whole, he covered many. And by the way, there are more, um, they, they get progressively harder for an entity, a city, our size to, to use, but there are even more. But so the idea is those things, we could leverage those with a developer into making something happen that otherwise wouldn't have because it wasn't quite there. And I think that's where we can create magic. Well, one problem that, that I do see uh, is something you uh, brought uh, up earlier, Councilor Mayhew, is the issue of, um, well, if we issue this uh, RFP that isn't specific enough with enough tools, then we don't get any response and therefore we don't get any dealing done. <laughs> so we have to say that these are the things we're willing to work with them on and we have to mean it um, when we do that. Um, so yeah, it's sort of the balancing act. Yeah, Councilor Mayhew. Dead right, in my view, exactly right. And and this creates sort of one of the, the challenges of trying to be us working in this environment. And I, I think Councilor Watton's been trying to deal with this. Um, here's the thing. We're, we're a municipality, we're public, we don't do things behind closed doors, things have to be done in the light of day. Yet the conversation you want to have is developer, what 
what would work. But you can't do that, you know, out of sight. That's that's not how government works, right? So how do we have the conversation that's necessary to figure this out, yet do it in a way that's the way things are done? There are ways to solve it. Cities solve this, but it's not easy. It's hard. So I think um, I, I my view is sending out a proposed RFP without already knowing that there will be some responses to waste a whole bunch of people's time. We got to put together a package. We got to find a way to appropriately test that against developers. Find out do we have interest, and if we do, then I think we move on it. But I I think it's I think it's a pile of work. So then I would wonder then, is it uh, most beneficial then for the council to say, these are the tools that we're willing to use uh, in the RFP and empower staff in the administration then to do that work? Empower that these are Empowerment the might involve giving them some more staff to do the Yes, work. <laughs> empowering them with staff and tools. Um, so yeah. So let me shed one. light on a couple of things. Everything that you're saying is spot on. Um, we get this choice of either developing more affordable housing units with this limited money and some tax incentives that we can offer. But there's also the other side of it is is we could do housing preservation, and you see some of the four, six, or eight unit of apartment buildings that are mostly in the downtown here. It's same thing over in North Bend. You know, it may be putting on new roofs. It may be, you know, updating the the units or or taking larger units, making them smaller so they're more efficient. Um, that could be part of our solution with the idea is that you have to make them permanently affordable for the next 50 years. Um, and then we offer the multifamily tax exemption for the eight or 12 years, whatever the state law allows. Um, the other consideration is the smaller the units, the less impact there is on the schools. Um, making them larger and family units, that's that's has more impact. Walkability and, and being able to uh, leverage what little transit we have here is very important. Um, and the other thing is, as we've been talking with nonprofits, 100 seems to be the number mm -hmm. because they need to have management on site and we need that as well. And so we may be looking at developing this and if we could leverage the property across the parkway with the blessing of the Snoqualmie tribe, we might be able to be more feasible in getting to that number of 100. Uh, but I do think that the incentives and, and saying, OK, if you build it 50 percent AMI and you put in 30 units of that, we're going to give you X dollars for doing that. Um, so I think we need to kind of figure that out. And you're absolutely right, um, Council Member Mayhew, is that we need nonprofits to give us feedback. And I've asked them for that. And they said not until you have an RFP. So. Um, you know, I, I wish it were that easy. So we, we're going to have to put ourselves out there a little bit and figure out what the tools are and rely on our community development director, Arteche, for some guidance in, in how to put that together. And I hope that's helpful. Then it sounds like maybe it's not a total waste of time to uh, issue an RFP. If there are folks who aren't even willing to talk to us until we have one. That's for me. Yeah. No, so it's, I think we were saying the same thing, which is, we, so we can send out an RFP tomorrow. We just whip some, something up. We're not getting any responses. You have to have something that's going to get responses, which is a whole bunch of work to make sure you put the right stuff in there. If you just put in, eh, you know, the, the list of all possible things is we'd love to hear. It's, it's you're asking them to do too much work. They won't do it. That's been my experience. So we've got to get something that's got enough targeted and specific information that you get a response. Then you can move into, I think, some 
development of an actual idea. So that that's my understanding of it. I don't know if that's the same as what Councilmember Watt was intending to say. Can I defer? Sorry. Yes, uh, Director Arteche. Director Arteche. That, that's exactly what I was thinking, too. And we have about 20 people on the list that we could send a survey to, call on the phone, send an email to um, whatever technique we wanted to and ask, what's the likelihood, uh, you know, if you received an RFP, RFQ tomorrow, what's the likelihood that you'd put it together and give them some loose parameters and get a feeler? Um, because, yeah, I mean, these these are complex documents. They take a lot of time to put together. Um, and we wouldn't we wouldn't want to, you know, waste our time, waste our our precious resources um, without having some positive responses. And, and am I right that in that dialogue that would hopefully occur when we say here's seven things or how many it is that we're thinking about that we could ask them to say, you know, which one of these are real? And we'd be able to find out, hey, they're really interested in one, three, six, and seven. Two is great, but not so. Like, we'd really be able to sort of, I think, gather from that, sort of hone in on what's really going to interest them. Is that correct? And we know what they want, what they really, really want. <laughs> <laughs> because because uh, a survey was recently done to say, hey, what is it that that you need out of these kinds of projects? So um, in general terms, we know that I think it would we'd have to we'd have to kind of go through the menu to see like what what what's that leverage point, you know, for them to click. Mm -hmm. Dr. Johnson. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor Ross. So I think we do have a it's like a special meeting or roundtable coming up on this, I was trying to find out when, I think it's like it, the so, second okay. council meeting of November. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so we can have further discussion regarding that. All right. And I guess uh, to be continued. Yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on that item? All right, so that takes us to the next thing, <laughs> which is three uh, big things. Well, four balls is really important. Um, uh, which is uh, the um, the comprehensive plan update. There are three items. We have the <clears throat> economic development recommendations. We have the housing recommendations and the land use recommendations. Um, and uh, we only have seven minutes left. So I'm not sure how fruitful the discussion we're going to have in the next seven minutes. Um, yes, uh, uh, Director Arteche. Well, I didn't want to interrupt you, though. Go ahead. So... Um... I agree that the six and a half minutes is an adequate time um, to look at the volume uh, of, of work, this body of work that's coming forward to you in a very um, steady stream. Mm -hmm. The concern I have is that we started mounting this stream in August, and now we're approaching December. And um, what, what creative ways can we come up with to try and process the information and maybe I should just pause there and, and for a second and say, okay, taking a deep breath, the next one that that's coming out of the planning commission won't go to you. So maybe that's a good thing. Um, transportation and the one following won't go to you. It'll, it, it'll um, capital facilities. Both of those will go to the, the parks and public works um, committee. So, um, uh, but one more will be coming and possibly another one after that, which is, the environment and and climate change and the city did receive a very healthy half a million dollars to to do a climate change element which would be the first um we might even be the first in the in the future sound to to get it underway if we can um get all, get all our ducks in line yes. half a million to solve climate change perfect <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah, we do have the, that issue that we have a bit of a backlog. It sounds like we might have a little bit of time. Uh, one of the things that uh, Director Arteche and I talked about was the possibility of uh, one of the December meetings. I guess we only have the the one the first December. Uh, we don't have a special meeting, um, a roundtable session planned for that um, for that council meeting. So we thought that's one possibility for the council to take those up then. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if if that's made any progress. I think, so I think that maybe maybe no. Okay. Um, and if not, then um, 
then uh, yeah, at our next meeting in, uh, let's see, so we could have as many as three more meetings this year uh, for this committee. Uh, if we maybe move them up to the beginning of uh, our next few meetings uh, to make sure that we started getting through them a little bit faster, maybe we could get them done before the end of the year. Um, one of them, I believe we were almost ready to move on from was, if I remember correctly, it was the land use. And I believe it was just the council member Christensen had some questions and we had a cross buck and we didn't get to address those concerns. But other than that, we might be able to move forward pretty quickly on that one, leaving us with just the two. Uh, yeah, Director Artechik. Except for if you looked at your packet, um, you know, we are taking some very proactive approaches with the regional government and the state government for early and often comments and two minor comments did come in on land use. There are two recommended adjustments um, there. I would call them pretty straightforward. Um, so um, I, I don't believe they would be controversial, take a lot of time or anything like that. But um, so there is that as well. Okay. So hopefully if we just uh, put those at the beginning of the meeting, we could try to get through those uh, somewhat quickly over the next couple of meetings then. Um, other than that, <laughs> what else to say about it? Okay. Um, was there anything that um, the committee wanted to say about any of those items, just as heads up, or are we ready to move on? Uh, Councilor Mayhew. No, just wanted to make a quick comment. I've been having conversations over the last two weeks with various other elected officials at the county and state level about the issue of the PSRC's assignment to Snoqualmie of future housing, uh, what's the word? Um, uh, affordable, affordable needs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And there has been great response of a willingness to help us from a political perspective. I know, Director Hart Artechi, you're working the the process that we have to do, but there's a political aspect to that all, and there's great interest. So I just want to say, let me know if you'd like to discuss that further. I think that there's a whole advantage to getting some political push behind this to help us. You know, so often we're the small sort of crumbs left on the big thing they're trying to do, but I think there's willingness to help us out there. Let's take advantage of it. Uh, yeah, director. Yeah, I I um really appreciate you making those comments, and I just wanted to say thank you, council. I mean, you started here. You know, we came to you. We told that we told you that we would need some help. And so the council um, has been addressed. They're very supportive, and you know, taking it to the next level is going to be important too. Uh, then if there is no further business tonight, uh, then it is uh, 6.58, and uh, I will uh, say that we are adjourned. Thank you all for being here.